Welcome to the April Kogi seminar. My name is uh, Pedro Arduino, and uh, I am the Kogi uh, uh, moderator for this for this webinar. Kogi uh, is the Committee on Geological and Geotechnical Engineering, and it is one of the standing committee of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine Board on Earth Sciences and Resources. Kogi was established as the focal point within the National Academies for government, industry, and academia on technical and public policy issues related to earth processes and materials, soil and rock mechanics, responsible human development, and mitigation of natural and human hazards. If you have any questions about Kogi, please contact Samantha Maxino from the National Academies uh, Group, which is the staff director of the committee. This webinar is part of a quarterly webinar series produced by COGI through the support of the National Science Foundation. The webinar will be posted on YouTube and announcement will be sent uh, out when it is available. Open your chats, please, for messages from us and for the speaker bios as we proceed with the seminar. Also, I would like to thank Samantha Maxino and Sarah Heydrich for helping to organize and produce these and all the COGI webinars. We will have time for questions and answers after all the panelists give their talks. So the audience can submit their questions anytime using the question and answers tab on the Zoom panel on their screens. We will pose as many questions as uh, possible uh, during, uh, during our time. First, a small disclaimer, any opinions, conclusions, or recommendations expressed by the panelists or anyone during this webinar are those of the individuals and do not represent conclusions or recommendations of the National Academies of Science and Engineering or Medicine. With that, I would like to introduce to the moderator of the group of speakers that we have today for this webinar. His name is Mike Olson. So Professor Olson is a professor specializes in geomatics at the Oregon State University. He serves as the editor-in-chief of the ASC Journal of Surveying Engineering, president of the Surveying and Geomatics Educator Society, technical director for the NSF Natural Hazards Research Infrastructure Rapid Facility, and the director of the Cascadia Lifetimes Program. His research program centers on advanced geospatial technologies for geohazards assessments and infrastructure management. It is a pleasure to have this group of people today who I admire a lot, and in particular, they are good friends. So Mike, the floor is yours. Awesome, thank you so much, Pedro, and thank you to everybody for your participation in today's webinar. We're very excited to, to talk about a lot of new geospatial technologies and how they can be used in geotechnical investigations and, and really kind of get home the point that these technologies are available and ready to, to use now. So I'd like to kind of start talking about what uh, we call the geospatial life cycle. Um, you know, we've, we've kind of seen a big shift in the engineering community recently where um, over the past several decades where you know, prior to this, we were, we were thinking in terms of project by project. We would build something, we would put a lot of energy and investment into building a, a project, and then a lot of the records and information would kind of disappear. Over time, we started to realize that that wasn't the best way to manage our assets, and we've more been thinking in terms of a life cycle approach, looking at our integration between infrastructure. And geomatics technologies are really at the heart of effective asset management and maintenance practices and, and really integrating all the different disparate expertise that need to come together in order to ma effectively manage infrastructure. So the, the geospatial technologies are there at the start of the life cycle and acquiring the information on what the conditions are, modeling it and, and doing the analysis of what needs to be updated um, in terms of uh, what's going on with the, the infrastructure where hazards are located, landslides, rock falls, all those kind of things. And then at the core of applying the fixes in machine control and construction automation. And so there's a lot of different technologies and a lot of different ways that, that these can be used. And I think that leads to one of the challenges in terms of the technology adoption lifecycle. And so I'll kind of start this, this figure with the angry purple dude. And basically, I think this is a situation we find ourselves a lot in when we see a new technology. We're, we're doing something, we're getting frustrated because we're not getting the quality of data that we want. We want something faster, cheaper, better, right? That's, that's what everybody wants. 
So then we start talking to people. So-and-so says, hey, this is the technology you should be using. This is going to solve all your problems and oversells it, right? And so you're all excited and saying, all right, let's, let's get on board and do it. You try to do it and the technology doesn't quite work out the way that you hoped. Uh, you're in tears. The vendor overpromised, and the, the technology under delivered and so on. You reach out to experts and others to kind of help you get it and you get more experience with it. And then you start to realize, oh yeah, this is, this is going to work. This is what I need. But then, oh wait, no, I want to now do it faster, cheaper, better now that I know I can do this, right? And we, we kind of get locked in, into these, these different cycles. And so what we wanted to kind of talk about today is how to deal with all these new emerging technologies, how to make effective use of what's available in practice, and really start to make decisions on, you know, what technologies are effective to use in different applications and show some demonstrated uh, case studies, as you'll see from the different panelists in just a moment. With these technologies, there's huge variabilities in terms of accuracy and what you can do. Uh, I think one big challenge is there's fewer opportunities for education in geomatics. And so, you know, a number of years ago, all your civil engineering students would take multiple classes in, in surveying and, and measurement science. And now that's been shrunk down quite a bit. And so people don't really get that kind of exposure to, to measurement, understanding terms like uncertainty, precision, accuracy, resolution, all those, those kind of things and, and get thrown out and confusing. And that leads to some of the issues that people face in, in terms of adopting the technology. Um, the good news is though, the technology is becoming more available. And so it's, it's getting easier to use. There's simpler forms of ways to use the technology. Um, for example, when we talk about LiDAR technology, it used to be limited to very bulky platforms and we've seen downsizing. Um, in fact, the newest iPhones in the, the Pro series have a LiDAR sensor on it. Um, but the, the caveat to that is we have this technology that's now more readily accessible, but it doesn't necessarily provide the accuracy that we need in engineering type work. And so we have to be very careful um, in interpreting data and analyzing data coming out of these, these different newer sensors and making sure that they meet, meet the need of the applications. Um, you know, the, the other key advantage to these geomatics technologies is, is we have the ability to capture the context of the entire scene. You know, a lot of what we do in engineering, we're looking at plan and profile. Uh, we're just seeing bits and pieces of the picture of what's going on. And with the geomatics technologies, we can really kind of see that full picture and see how observations of what's going on in one part of the infrastructure affects what's going on uh, further away. And we get that increased detail to be able to do it. So I wanna talk a little bit about how, how can we determine what the best tool is uh, for the job in terms of doing things. Now with these technologies, there's a whole ton of applications and lots of different ways that, that these can be used. This is just a sampling of different types of geotechnical or structural analyses that can be done uh, with current technology that's available um, for, for anybody to, to pick up and use. Obviously requires a lot of training and experience to, to be able to use these and um, be able to use them effectively in engineering analysis. But we can use these for looking at all sorts of uh, different challenges in, in terms of sediment analysis, looking at what's going on in terms of slope stability. We can look at change detection, what's happening as rivers migrate through areas and, and kind of predict where, um, where those changes are going to happen. We can also use them to look at the structure and connection with the, the soil and uh, make some decisions on what's going on, where the stresses are accumulating, where the deformations are, and in many cases, monitor things before catastrophic failure happens and, and get that. So there's, there's lots of different applications, um, but the important thing to keep in mind is that every application has a different quality level necessary for it. And so in this, this plot, this is work we did for the Transportation Research Board in um, Mobile LiDAR Guidelines and Transportation. And on the x-axis is our uh, 3D accuracy, and on the y-axis is the point density or the resolution of the data. And so there's a, a big difference in terms of different applications as far as what you need in terms of the resolution and the accuracy of the data. And you know, the question you may be asking yourself is, well, why don't, we, why don't we just always collect the highest resolution and the highest accuracy? And the answer to that is that oftentimes it becomes very expensive to do that. It becomes orders of magnitude to just improve the accuracy slightly. There's a whole lot more work you have to do in terms of your survey control and other things to achieve that, or in terms of point density. Now you've increased your data volume and the processing workflows become very challenging. And so what's very important is to identify your applications and identify kind of where on this spectrum they fit in terms of accuracy and point density requirements, as well as kind of the size of the area. And then you can use that to kind of make determinations of what is most economical um, in terms of your, your data collection strategy and make those, those decisions with that. Um, so the key driver really in a lot of this is, is the cost. 
And so here's just a, another plot that shows spatial resolution and measurement uncertainty and kind of where different technologies fit in and on the spectrum of the plot. So something like uh, GPS technology, there's many different forms of it and there's many different accuracies associated with that, you know, from your consumer devices, like in your cell phone, that don't really have the best accuracy, usually on the order of several meters in terms of accuracy to static GPS, where you can get down to about millimeter or centimeter level type accuracy with those systems and similarly in, in LIDAR. Um, so there's, there's a huge disparity in this that that's very important to kind of get down in those details as you work on adopting these, these different technologies. So now where can you go to get kind of some information about it? Well, this webinar is a great start. You'll hear from some experts who've used technology in a lot of different types of applications. Um, there's a facility I'd like to highlight. That's the RAPID facility up at the, the University of Washington uh, that hosts a wide range of equipment in terms of laser scanning, uh, UAS, other types of instrumentation like seismometers that are available for, for renting, predominantly focused on, focused on natural hazards reconnaissance. Um, but part of what this facility does is also provide training and support and, and education on using these technologies effective in a lot of different applications. So with that, I'd like to, to turn the time over to our first panelist, uh, Zhang Wang Ning from Sixth Sense Engineering, who's going to talk about a lot of the different monitoring applications and innovative work that they're doing uh, to monitor a wide range of infrastructure projects. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you for this invitation. Thank you for everyone attending. Uh, so my presentation is more of a state of the practice, showing you what can you do with a robotic uh, total station for large infrastructure geotechnical monitoring. And first of all, the main purpose of performing geotechnical instrumentation monitoring for urban construction project mostly is for risk control. Control the risk during the construction and for design verification. And today it also provide rich and valuable data set for, for research, particularly like machine learning based research. Um, these, are these are typical scenario uh, of um, um, infrastructure monitoring. As you can see, um, what we commonly do today using a robust total station for ground surface and for building deformation monitoring and sometimes uh, remote sensing, satellite remote sensing got involved. And for most of the underground subsurface um, soil deformation or power pressure, um, um, practitioners are using more conventional uh, geotechnical sensors such as inconometer, extensometer, piezometer that I uh, might talk today well, primary focus on robotic robust total station. And then total station, I think, is a um, um, a, a widely known instrument, uh, survey instrument uh, with a long history of development. And uh, with the today's new newest development, so the total station can do a lot of things, um, deformation monitoring, but also integrate camera, GNSS scanner, and it also most importantly allow for remote control. Uh, so which is uh, very suitable for real time deformation monitoring. Uh, so the idea is uh, you will, uh, so first of all, there are two, two modes uh, by using total station. One is using the targets or the survey presence. Another is a refractor list. So basically you identify the zone of the inference caused by construction, and then you install the target, attach the target to the buildings or the, to the road surfaces. And then but most importantly, you have to identify, you have to put the reference presence or benchmark of a bedside, uh, whatever we call it, outside the zone of inference. So, and then through the automatic target recognition, if any of the, the monitoring prism move, the totalization will automatically tracking the small movement of the prison and, and deliver millimeter, millimeter level accuracy uh, modern data. And uh, we can also do refractor list, uh, but in this case, you only get 1D most of the time, settlement heave. Uh, so compared to LIDAR, uh, the using total station for refractor list monitoring uh, produce uh, lower density uh, points that allow for much faster processing. And uh, so today, uh, most of the, so that's the, the wireless communication that connecting different components of the, the, the monitoring system. So usually through an IoT device, uh, you can remotely control the total station and then all the data will be transmitted to a cloud-based server and then allow 
the engineer to do the data analysis or allow the, uh, the surveyor uh, to remotely control or reprogram the dotalization. And here are a few typical configuration or setup of a totalization for infrastructure um, project. You can put a totalization inside a tunnel, along the bridge, or along the highway. And then I'm going to talk about a few uh, case studies uh, real quick. And this is one of the typical scenario of using totalization uh, that combine the prison mode and the refractorless modes. Um, uh, think about as a tunnel uh, construction uh, under underground. So um, the, the, the surveyors can install the prisons on the facade of the building and also identify lots of refractorless points on the surface so without interfering the traffic. And in that way, you can achieve the real-time monitoring for both the buildings and the foreground surface. And so one of the um, examples of um, uh, SR99 tunnel project in Seattle between 2012 to 2017, I think it's a well-known tunneling project. And uh, it, it's not a very long tunnel, but it was constructed by uh, the largest um, uh, TBM, EP, EPV TBM at that time. And then uh, over 160 buildings are uh, within the zone of influence and then uh, nearly 40 total sessions were installed to monitor both the, the prisons, as you can see, that attached to the viaduct, uh, which is now uh, completely de de uh, de um, um, removed now, replaced by the new tunnel. And uh, this is a very quick video, shows you during that monitoring 2017 to 27, uh, 2012 to 2017, the, the main Seattle downtown area uh, was covered by these uh, robust decolorization monitoring network. Um, another ongoing project in, in Canada near Toronto, as we can see, these are low, um, shallow, uh, overburdened um, railway tunnel and then uh, constructed under the 21 lane uh, highway, uh, so require very high density and very high frequency monitoring. But in the meantime, uh, you are not allowed to interfere the highway traffic. So eight total stations will install and with nearly 500 refractorless point, which provide um, high frequency uh, settlement monitoring of the highway. And uh, yeah, so um, so the project. Um, so for each. So what this photo show one of the total station tower with the one uh, two total station one on top of each other. Uh, so we can we can program the total station the one total station cover a larger area and with another one focus on the active construction zone. So with a different monitoring frequency. And then last, I have a few more uh, slides showing you different application. So this one is using total station for deactivation project which is monitoring the, the lateral deformation of the shoring structure for the excavation and um, can also be used for, to monitor the bridge and during the foundation repair of the bridge. And uh, the last one is for dam. Um, for now, there are lots of Asian dams across the USA and then lots of them require a repair and a foundation improvement. So that's another application of using robust total station. Uh, finally, um, summarize some advantages or limitation of the technology. As I mentioned earlier, it provides very high frequency measurement and uh, allows you to connect the measurement to a real-time early warning system. And uh, when using refractories, does not require traffic control or closure, and also is a cost-effective solution for long-term monitoring. And uh, one thing that I want emphasize here is also reduce the exposure of a few monitoring personnel to common construction site hazard and then also uh, reduce COVID exposure um, in the last two or three years. And certainly there are some limitations. If a lot of site got blocked and then you are not able to gather data. And the um, also the data quality will be affected by the weather condition. It's not going to give you high quality data during the rainy season or the snowy season. And uh, you do need a permit or right of entry to install the totalization of the prison at the desired location. And the vandalism um, is a concern in urban area. That happened a lot in the last two years during COVID, unfortunately. And then uh, you need to have a real, you really have to have a stable uh, 
reference point. Um, so make sure you put a point outside the zone or zone of inference. Uh, some of those limitations will be overcome and then uh, by other technology that will be introduced by uh, the next two uh, speaker. So with that, let me introduce our next uh, speaker, Ben Lashinsky, Associate Professor from Oregon State University. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today and appreciate it, Zhang Wei. We're gonna switch gears a bit and go from the urban environment to the coastal environment. So, coastal retreat is a problem worldwide. Wave attack, you know, just the, the waves hitting these sea cliffs can result in a variety of mass wasting events, including scour, overhanging rocks failing, slumps and sea cliff collapse, and in the case, case of coastal adjacent landslides, debuttressing in advance towards the ocean. Here in Oregon, we have a project where we've been monitoring a series of sea cliffs and coastal landslides for years now, looking at the change over time using a variety of tools. So in Oregon, we have about 300 miles of coastline, about 100 miles of which are sea cliffs of soft rock. Our beautiful Highway 101 is beautiful because it happens to span those sea cliffs and have an amazing view of the ocean. The problem is the, the highway itself is quite close to these areas that are quite unstable. To look at the dynamics of this, this coastal environment, we've used a variety of tools, including in situ instrumentation like MEMS in place inclinometers, terrestrial LIDAR, UAS LIDAR, photogrammetry, GNSS surface monitoring, and using these techniques together or alone to look at how the coastal environment changes over time. Here is a typical winter day. This is low tide. Now, pretty stormy, as you can see. There is, it's a bit grainy, but there's cobbles down there. And there's a hundred foot piece of driftwood being picked up and hurled into the base of a sea cliff. These are the typical conditions that result in quite significant scour as we, uh, as we see in the winter environment. And quite a bit of that scour results in change. The sites we'll look at quickly uh, span from Northern Oregon to Southern Oregon with very different geologies, with the Northern sites being more prone to just failure of a, a, from scour and sea cliff collapse, while the Southern sites tend to be home to very large coastal landslides. So to look at change of sea cliffs, we look at terrestrial LIDAR collected twice a year to evaluate what we kind of see with our eyes, but it's difficult to quantify. We see that those mechanisms as I've described, collapse, scour, accretion of debris that's failed, occurs on a yearly basis. And the retreat is variable in space and time, it can span orders of magnitude. One of our sites, the northernmost one, you can see kind of a color scale here in the change determined from LIDAR change detection, red being retreat in two meters and blue being accretion or the gain of elevation here. We can see big collapses in the north as well as overhang failures to the south. And notably a bit of green and blue here, which actually reflects the advance of a slump down at the site. We can also see the typical erosion rates that we see per meter of sea cliff here and start to constrain the rates of lateral retreat we associate with coastlines and use that as a metric to evaluate hazards and risk. Arch Cape, well, this is a site just adjacent to a tunnel. We can see that typical wave scour occurring at the toe of this site. And it is pretty significant. So one of the homes down here in the south actually has a hot tub that's hanging two feet off the sea cliff. Erosion is pretty severe here. Spencer Creek, our longest site, central Oregon coast, we can see large changes, slumps, cliff collapse, another change here. In this notable region of green, there's actually a landslide advancing in this location. And we can start to quantify some of the change of these, these uh, contrasting processes. Speaking of landslides, you can't just evaluate landslide movements from change in the sea cliff itself. Landslide movements, landslides move in a very complex fashion. They often do at least developing means of evaluating those movements and how they vary across an actual landslide is one thing we've also looked into. We've used LIDAR at the surface, as well as MEMS inclinometers, GNSS surface monitoring, to start to characterize the motion. Use these techniques together to evaluate how are these environments changing. First, we'll take a trip to Arizona in. You can see here the results of MEMS inclinometer. We have a change of profile in time. Each one of these colored lines represents half hour increments. 
And you can see that we can start to develop a velocity profile vertically over time. And we can even see some large jumps that occur during big events, both wave events and rainfall. So this site happens to be prone to very severe coastal erosion and significant debuttressing of this slide. We have GNSS units placed with these red uh, cross symbols here. And notice that there's Rover 1, 2, and 3 through the main slide area. Rover 1 is moving the fastest. Rover 2 is moving a bit slower. Rover 3, the slowest. A sign of retrogression driven by very significant coastal retreat here, kind of a bottom-up process. We have another landslide in the very south of the Oregon coast called the Huskanaden Landslide, one of our monitoring sites. It's a, it's a tiny landslide at 20 million cubic meters, and it's an earth flow that advances a teeny bit, two to four meters a year. This highway is repaved constantly throughout the year. Well, in 2019, the landslide decided to move just a bit more, 40 meters. It had a surge event, which just happened to be the most severe, right where the highway traverses the landslide. It closed the highway for two weeks. They were constantly trying to rebuild and open the highway during this period. We had a MEMS inclinometer in there. It lasted a good 40 days, rest in peace. And we saw a clear shear zone about 30, uh, 30 meters in depth. We have rovers still placed on it after they regraded the whole area. And it's still constantly creeping despite the hydrological controls you're trying to, to have there. But we also have some data from the actual surge event itself. Here's some imagery from uh, UAS. You can see seeps coming out of the landslide, the main surge zone, which again, dislocated Highway 101 quite a bit. Here's, here's uh, ODOT reopening the highway, or at least trying to get construction access as the landslide started to slow. Right there's our instruments. Obviously, they're gone. And with that imagery, you can actually start to look at surface displacements. Here, this is using particle image velocimetry. It's a hard word to pronounce, but PIV. And we looked at change of images. And you can see the clear flow of the, the actual surge itself dislocating the highway. And it gives us high spatial resolution of surface displacements. After the, the surge event was over, we decided to collect UAS LIDAR and start to look at change using high spatial resolution data here. We performed some manual fe feature tracking to evaluate the kinematics of this, this earth flow. And well, here's what we see. Similar to what we saw from the, the PIV analysis, we can look at lateral surface displacements, the largest being, of course, right where the highway crosses. Vertical surface displacements can also be evaluated. There is pretty large vertical changes stemming all the way from the source area all the way to the lower bench. In this case, there's pretty significant erosion at the coastal bluff here, but it's marginal compared to how this slide is driven by water in particular. In fact, one interesting thing when we started looking at this site years ago was the, how, how eroded the sea cliff was at the base. We were pretty surprised that after the surge event, all of a sudden there were two sea cliffs because the landslide advanced so much and actually towed out at the beach. So in summary, there's a variety of monitoring techniques that you can use to get high resolution data in space and time, and, and often it's a balancing act, as Mike alluded to. These tools are valuable for coastal environments in particular. It's dynamic, it's always changing, and there's plenty of hazards in an environment like that. In terms of a monitoring plan, redundancy is key. In, in place systems like inclinometers are valuable for giving us geotechnical data, but they might not last long in these dynamic environments. It's good to have other data sets to compare and continue monitoring, even if you start to lose instruments. And the reasoning being that we all know if something will go wrong or could go wrong, it's going to, as well as whenever you're not looking, that's when events tend to happen. But having technologies like this allow you to infill those data gaps. So with that said, I'd like to introduce the next speaker here, Chris Massey. Hi everyone, how are you? My name's Chris, I'm from uh, GNS Science in New Zealand. And I thought we would uh, go through some, um, kind of take things from away from the coast uh, and start looking at earthquakes. And so what I'm gonna talk about now is monitoring rock slopes through an earthquake sequence. And I'm going to focus mainly on the Christchurch earthquakes sequence, which occurred in 2010 and 2011. Um, it affected New Zealand's largest city 
And most of you may have heard of the uh, liquefaction, which is pretty famous um, around the world for what these earthquakes actually caused. However, as you can, you can see from this map here, the, um, the earthquakes also um, occurred under um, a, a relic extinct volcano. Um, and so therefore there was quite a lot of slope instability. So what you can see here um, on the screen now is just the, the different earthquakes um, greater than magnitude three that occurred within, um, that occurred associated with each particular um, earthquake sequence and within a certain time period. So we, we started with the Darfield earthquake in 2010, then we had the 22nd of February earthquake, then we had the 13th of June earthquake, then we had the 23rd of December earthquake, and then we had the 14th of February earthquake, which was kind of centered un under all this mess over here in the Port Hills. So you can see we have considerable number of earthquakes and there were multiple um, recordings at the strong motion stations of greater than 1G in several of these earthquakes. So this is a, an aerial view of the uh, Port Hills of Christchurch. Um, you can quite clearly see the, um, the remnants of the volcano here. The center of the volcano is around Littleton Harbour. The liquefied area is around central Christchurch. Um, but the main issue in the Port Hills were rock falls and debris avalanches caused by the, um, the earthquakes. So the geology of the Port Hills, um, it's a dissected slopes of the, of the Miocene Age volcano. It's like 11 million years old. It's multiple volcanoes. There are basalt lava flows, which grade laterally into breccia, scoria, agglomerates. They're mantled by younger uh, Quaternary Age lurs, which is windblown sands and silts. And they are highly variable, both vertically and spatially, horizontally. These photographs show some of the rock falls and debris avalanches that occurred in the Port Hills. Now, um, people built right up against the toes of these rock slopes. Um, people built quite long distances away from the rock slope. So this house at the bottom left, um, the boulder traveled 700 meters from the slope at the top left and went straight through the house. Um, the rock falls and debris avalanches killed five people in the Port Hills um, and affected 400 properties. So the inventories that we had to collect to, to try to put all this together and to understand what was happening so that we could then inform the decision makers um, with regards to you know where to rebuild post earthquake, um, we had to collect multiple data sets, multiple epochs of ortho rectified air photos, repeat airborne terrestrial lidar surveys, field mapping, so analog surveys, i.e. mapping rock falls. Um, then we had to look at ground deformation um, uh, monitoring and surveys um, using a whole combination of factors, GNSS. Um, static survey marks, we installed um, rain gauges, soil moisture monitoring, ground pore water pressure monitoring and robotic total stations, um, as what we heard previously. So this is just some examples from the, the Richmond Hill slope. Um, what you can see here is the difference between airborne LIDAR versus terrestrial LIDAR in the number of points that are actually on the surface. Um, and obviously terrestrial LIDAR um, is much more effective on steep slopes because you get a higher concentration of, of points actually from the from the surface. And what we can do here though is over time and uh, multiple epochs of survey, we can use these multiple epochs of survey as, as Ben and Mike and the others talked about to difference and we can look at the differences which we can then turn into volumes of material that fall off between epochs. Now in the Port Hills, we carried out around 14 to 15 surveys of these rock slopes during and after the earthquake sequence. We also mapped the geology. We also mapped the cliff top cracking. We also installed GNSS, which is the, um, the, the marker here, as well as having um, traditional static survey marks that we went to monitor. We, we then mapped the crack distributions using the high resolution aerial photographs. And we put all this together into our into these engineering geological conceptual models to try to understand how the slopes might perform in future earthquakes and non earthquake events. And so these are these kind of a typical conceptual model. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing cliff top cracking, slumping, rock and debris avalanches and falls from the face of the cliff between the successive earthquakes, as well as this slumping failures behind the bits that fall off. 
we're seeing significant impedance contrast within the slopes themselves. You know, we're going from up to 4,000 meters per second shear wave velocity into 600 and then up into a couple of hundred. Um, we're also seeing topographic effects from amplification of shaking because the, the slopes are relatively steep and, and, and narrow. And so we put all this together using all these different technologies to try to then forecast what the, uh, what the slopes might do in future events. We can do this uh, statistically, and this is where we use the change model data sets. So we take our 14 epochs of, 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 of uh, change models for the different slopes. We look at those epochs of change that relate to earthquakes, and we look at kind of statistically where those changes are occurring on the face. And we can use machine learning algorithms like logistic regression to analyze those areas that fell off against the factors that may contribute to why they fell off and where. And so this plot here is essentially telling us that the ground acceleration is the most important thing follow, during earthquakes um, to generate rock falling from the slopes. The next important factor was the relative elevation. So the higher the, 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 the slope, the, the more material fell off or the, or the material fell from maybe the higher portions of the slope. And then, it, then the next interesting factor is the percent of the neighbors that failed. So this is the number of cells adjacent to the one that failed in previous survey epochs. So essentially, this is looking at the stress redistribution as material falls from the cliff face. So it's a very powerful way of taking those change models and then starting to really get into the nitty gritty detail of what's driving them, which we can then feed into our numerical physics based simulations. So where we're going with this then is the benefit of having these terrestrial um, LIDAR change models through the sequence. And they span from 20, 2010 all the way through to 2016. And so we've captured both the, the effects of the earthquakes on the rockfall rates, but also the non-earthquake contribution. So this is like the rain, typically rain events. And so what these plots show for each of the main slopes in the Port Hills is that you get the earthquakes coming through, you get this massive increase in rockfall rates above the pre-earthquake baseline rockfall rates, which we determine from trenching and dating the pre-existing talus piles on the surface of the slopes before the earthquake sequence. And then what we can do then is over time, when there's no earthquakes during our terrestrial laser scan surveys, we can track the, the decay in rockfall rates with time after the major earthquake back to the pre-earthquake rates. And in this case, they take between two to five years after the 22nd of February earthquake, which was the main earthquake that generated the largest ground motions in the Port Hills. Um, and so after two to five years, we're back at background rates. And so what we're finding then is that immediately after the earthquake, the rock mass is damaged. And so you only need a relatively small amount of rain to remove those unstable blocks because the slopes are highly susceptible to, to failure. But as time goes by and as more of the highly damaged rock mass is removed, you need successively more rain and higher rain intensities to, to move material from the slope, which then drives this overall decay in, in, in non-seismic rockfall rates. Now, this is the conceptual model that, we're, that we've put together. And so essentially what we're saying here is that before the earthquake, we have a, a few, a few non-earthquake related rockfalls. We get a major earthquake come through. It damages the rock mass, which then increases the likelihood of rockfall from non-seismic sources like rain. And over time, after the earthquake sequence decays, we then drop back to the T naught or the time before the earthquake. Now, why is this important? It's important because this drives rockfall risk and rockfall risk drove the, um, the authorities in the Port Hills, the central government, to, with regards to their decision making over where and when people could be allowed back into their homes because the, when the risk levels decreased to an acceptable level. And also it governed the nature of the infrastructure that was installed. So for example, you can't just wait until the rockfall risk decays after five years because people need infrastructure. But this can help guide with regards to you may want to consider putting in cheap, low cost solutions and wait five years before you start building very complicated and costly permanent engineering works. So we, it's not just through earthquakes that we can use this information and these data sources. We can apply these to landslides all over the 
all over the world. This is another example um, in Fox Glacier. This is a, um, a, a 60 million cubic meter landslide. It's sliding. And then the front of the landslide is slumping and generating debris flows to create a big debris fan. We've, we've used terrestrial laser scanning, airborne LIDAR, and we've used a structure from motion um, digital surface models derived from tri-stereo satellite imagery captured by Plady satellite to generate change models in the same way that we've generated them in the port hills. Instead of using terrestrial laser scanning, we're using these other geospatial um, uh, techniques because the scale is so large. But we've also installed a GNSS and tilt meter, rain gauge, weather, soil moisture monitoring on a big concrete block that we dumped into the landslide from the bomb of a helicopter. And that's giving us um, 30 second data calculated at 24 hour, over 24 hour epochs um, for displacement and rainfall. And what this is doing, it's allowing us to link rainfall to movement which we can then use to give an idea of the when these landslides are likely to reactivate and when the debris flows are likely to come down the valley. And that that's important because during the before COVID times, we had up to 7,000 people a day visiting these, these valleys. So thank you very much for your uh, time. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors and if more information, we've just had a paper out in JGR on the Christchurch work, please feel free to go and have a look. And so just to conclude then, I would like to pass back over to Mike, who will then bring all of these various threads together. Thank you. All right, thank you, Chris. Um, so thank you to, to both Ben and Zongwei as well for, for all their excellent thoughts. Um, you know, kind of the goal today was to show you that there's a lot of different applications and ways that uh, these, these technologies can be used. This was a very quick run through a sampling of different technologies. There are lots of other technologies out there um, that, that can be used, but hopefully it demonstrated that the, the technology is mature enough to be used on a lot of different applications and provide usable information that can take it all the way to uh, policy decisions and um, as, as Chris mentioned in his presentation. Another thing to always keep in mind is, uh, you know, that's just because something's new and flashy doesn't mean that something older can't be repurposed or used. Um, so some old technologies can become new technologies and how they're used. Uh, for example, at the Geo Congress, there was a lot of discussion about fiber optic technology and how that could be uh, utilized as a monitoring technique. And, you know, that technology has been around for, for quite a while, but it's a, it's a new purpose in, in the way that it's being used. Um, one of the hopefully things you came away with from this, this webinar today is that these advanced technologies provide a more complete picture and understanding. And so sometimes people are hesitant to say, hey, I'm not gonna use this technology because it's gonna cost a little bit more upfront. Um, but the value that you get out of that information and really having that context of the whole broader scene can make a huge difference and ultimately allow you to catch issues early on in the project while you can still modify the design and do other things um, to avoid kind of those costly things that come later on when you hit some of those surprises. And also when you think in terms of if there's potentially going to be a litigation issue or something down the road, having that really high quality data up front can make a big difference. Another key factor is it's not just choose one technology or another. A lot of cases, a lot of these projects, as, as was tied together in the presentations uh, so well, was that there's a lot of different technologies that are used in concert together on a project because they all have their, their strengths and weaknesses. And when you use them together, you can kind of get the best of, of both worlds. So it's always important to think in, in terms of value. Um, it's important to know what you can do yourself versus what you need an expert for or what you need as assistance with. Um, and then there's all sorts of things in, in just kind of understanding those fundamental concepts of accuracy, resolution, and um, you know, kind of what the differences are between those. And so it's, it's important to kind of really kind of think through what what do you really need on the project and what's going to deliver the most uh, most value to those. Um, but at the end of the day, all these technologies are tools. And so it's important that they're used appropriately um, and that you you have a good handle on, on where their strengths are and where their limitations are. And that's the key to being able to use these successfully. Um, so with that, we, we thank you for your, your um, listening to us today and the, the presentation. Look forward to the discussion in the Q&A. And I'll turn the time back over to, to Pedro as the moderator. Thank you, thank you, uh, Mike. This was great, uh, great. I think, and I think that uh, we have um, fifteen minutes actually uh, to have some good questions. And there are some good questions in the questions in the questions and answers. So, first of all, uh, thank thank you everybody for joining us today. And please stay stay around because 
Uh, the round of questions could be also a complement to what uh, the speakers have been talking about. Um, the webinar will be posted, as I mentioned uh, before. Information will be sent about the, where, it, where it is posted and when. Uh, please go to the link provided in the chat uh, to give feedback about the, these webinars and also uh, any suggestions. And also look at the questions and answers if you still have some questions that you want to ask today. And again, I have to mention this disclaimer that any opinions, conclusions, or recommendations expressed by anyone during this webinar are those of the individuals and, no, and do not represent conclusions or recommendations of the National Academy of Science, Engineering, or uh, medicine, medicine. So uh, with this, I will start with some of the questions, hopefully uh, with, that we can answer. So the first one I, I will ask is a general question is for, my, uh, for uh, Mike. And uh, so the question is, while there is a lot that you have shown here that we should be learning on the technical side, sometimes the problem or the challenges are in the human aspects. And that could be the biggest barrier for the adoption. So what is your advice? Here is, how, what would you advise management and also others uh, to use these technologies? And uh, also how to learn about these technologies would be uh, something that you can include in your answer. All right, sounds good. Yeah, that's, those are some questions that I get regularly as I, I talk with a lot of people is sometimes, you know, it's like there's a technology barriers of just learning how to use it and 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 getting the technology to work and, and do what you want to. But oftentimes the bigger technology is is really kind of making the effective case within management as, as far as this is why we should adopt it and this is why it's going to save money down the road. And and oftentimes kind of what I've seen in, in practice uh, that's worked effectively is starting with some very small use cases and demonstrations. Um, so, you know, a lot of times in the past, I think people are reliant on vendors coming and showing flashy things. And, and, you know, that's sometimes helpful. But if you can have kind of smaller use cases where you pilot the technology, it's it's kind of a simpler application so you can wrap your head around it and kind of demonstrate it. That makes it a lot easier for people to visually see the results. And I, I think that's one of the beauties of a lot of these new technologies is they're so visual in nature that it makes it a lot easier to communicate what they're doing and, and what value and information that they provide uh, to the, the end users. And that can help a lot in terms of getting management. Um, there's, there's lots of studies uh, coming out with return on investment of these technologies, and in particular showing the cost of not adopting the technologies and then hitting an issue down the road. I think that's, that's always something important to kind of bring into that conversation and wait the decision of, does it make sense for us to adopt this technology or not? Okay. Um, I had a follow up on that question, but I will stay. I will ask uh, uh, Ben one question here. Right. Uh, one of the earlier questions that we had here is about how um, how to use the same type of technology for forest and vegetation monitoring. So that was one of the questions. And also, uh, if you can talk a little bit about the softwares used for your photogrammetry and model generation and analysis. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I happen to be in a college of forestry, so I only know this first answer through osmosis, but LIDAR is frequently used actually to do forest inventorying where they would, you know, get usually a, a aerial LIDAR or UAV LIDAR and more recently to actually get an idea of biomass and in repeated cases, growth of forest stands. It's also pretty valuable for actually getting an idea of inventory in places where you have sparse data I can think of some state forests or locations like that where it's commonly used. So it's pretty valuable for that, but it is intensive in data processing. As a geotechnical engineer, I usually throw away the trees and want the bare earth, but there's a whole group of people who don't want the bare earth and they just want the trees. So good question. And as to the software used to do the PIV, um, well, so first we, we often use Cloud Compare as one example of the software we use to process the, the photogrammetric data but there's a variety of packages out there. The PIV that we did, so the particle, I can never remember the full acronym, it's hard to pronounce, but we use MATLAB, but Python, which is open source, also has a variety of packages for that. There's a variety of sources for it in the end, but you do need two collections. Thanks, Pedro. Thank you, Thank you for the questions. Yeah, there will be a couple of more later, but uh, let's go to uh, uh, some way. I have several questions for you that are coming from the speakers. These are not my questions. And uh, 
related to RTS first, and then I have one on tailings. So they are separate. So okay. the first one is how to protect from vandalism, how to consider temperature, uh, how, uh, how, how far you can go with these, uh, these tools. If you can give us a little bit of hints on these things, uh, particularly, as I said, um, the, um, the temperature, vandalism, how to protect from vandalism, and how far you can go. OK, thank you. So those are commonly asked questions about using RTS. Uh, start from the easiest. Temperature is definitely considered as the that will be affecting the, the distance measurement. So for total fish, you have angular measurement, distance measurement, so temperature, as well as air, air pressure. Uh, usually measure at the same time and then uh, take into consideration in that uh, computation process. In terms of vandalism, unfortunately, in the last two or three years during COVID, that happened a lot. So from, from what I heard, I think last two years in Europe, there are about 80, 90 total station was stolen. And uh, so the manufacturers, they, they come up with some device allow them to track the, the asset, the stolen assets, and allow them to lock the device remotely. So we'll, we'll prevent people to resell them, to reuse them, but unfortunately that will not prevent people damaging equipment. Sometimes they got frustration. They, they, they are frustrated and not able to remove your, the, the total station, but it can still damage the total station. So um, maybe you can put a surveillance camera, but nowadays people can wear a mask. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not able to provide a very good answer, but uh, just to share some common challenges here. I understand your concern. So I hope some of the audience here can provide a more creative and effective way. And well, please share. Um, so the third question about distance. Um, I, is it about the, the, the monitoring distance or how far that can we go? What does that mean? Can you rephrase the question, Pedro? And no, the question is these total stations and um, you can do monitoring and but how far? So you can do a monitoring one kilometer outside oh, okay. or so, just meters outside. Okay, so according to the, the, the specification of the total station manufacturer, you can go um, uh, one kilometers maybe, but practic practically we usually control the distance from 100 meters to 150 meters. Number one, the, ac the, the distance measurement accuracy is a function of the distance, but most importantly, the light of the site. So for the urban construction monitoring project, if you put a target 1,000 meters away from the total station, most likely something will block the light of the site. So practically, I would say from 100 meters to 150 meters. Yeah. Okay. I, I will ask you the question, the other question later. If, uh, 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 but I, I, I want to ask uh, Chris one question here. It's more technical, the question, but I think it's good. Uh, how critical is in your analysis, Chris, uh, the selection of your spatial interpolation technique, uh, inverse distance weighting, krigging, etc., in order to get accurate and accurate uh, solution when dealing with this type of data sets? Or are these data sets so dense that this is not an issue? Ooh, there's a lot of a lot of fish hooks in that one. Um, no, just because they're dense doesn't mean that that they're right. <laughs> That's really important to understand that. Um, I, I use a recent example um, where we took a digital surface model from before the Kaikoura earthquake, derived from aerial photography. So this is high resolution. 0.2 meter ground resolution aerial photographs and we had a same survey done after the earthquake and we we corrected those digital surface models for tectonic deformation and in doing that we then ran what we call the bootstrap which is where we just take random selection of samples from those different data sets and we compare them and even after the tectonic displacement we found that there was a that these billions, I'm talking billions and billions of points, there was a systematic offset of about 0.4 of a meter in the vertical. So even though we had these billions and billions and billions of data points, there was still this systematic 0.4 meter offset, which we could then correct for. Could we just move all the points 0.4 of a meter? So, so I think it's really important to use different techniques to try to get into the uncertainties and that's what something that Mike talked about before within each of the data sets. And it might be that terrestrial laser scanning and 
uh, airborne lidar even though you can use them complementary you can actually use them to check the quality of each of the the data sets but you can also look at things like areas that aren't moving where you're very sure that, that they're not moving and then you can kind of check on those against areas that are moving okay so looking at then krieging and various kind of um uh kind of ways that you actually smooth the data i mean there's so many different ways that i mean out there and it really you have to really look at what the results are and what best fits what you're trying to see and if it doesn't look right then it's not right and i, and I think that's i don't think there's any magic kind of like one process or one methodology fits everybody i think you have to really try to work out what suits you and what suits you know what you're trying to achieve which is i think the kind of underlying kind of thread that mike's kind of putting through all of the work that we're talking about is that we've got all this technology you can't just throw it all at something and hope you get the right answer you have to actually think really carefully about what it is you're trying to achieve from it is that fair have i yeah no 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 it's it's, it's fair I got another very good for you, but I, I would like to go to some way again, once again. Uh, there was a question about monitoring um, uh, tailings. And you know, tail, tailings have a very uh, quick, they, they react because you don't see anything and suddenly, boom, things happen and you have a monster environmental effect like in Bernardino or other places. Can you use any of these technologies for tailings or have been used or there is some some thoughts on that? Yeah, um, turtle station has been used, but for many of the, the tailing them, I think they use a, a different type of uh, um, technologies, um, INSAR, LIDAR and uh, RTS, and sometimes um, by super ray as what Ben mentioned. So it really requires combination of instruments and. Uh, and then you do need uh, a combination of a real time, like wireless transducer, as well as the uh, the lidar, which give you a, a, a full picture of everything. Uh, um, as uh, Michael mentioned earlier, each uh, technology is an advantage or disadvantage. When you get a full picture, you get high density data point, and the computational process is longer, which does not allow you to do real time monitoring. But um, yeah, so it, it's a mix. Uh, and then I hope this answer your question or partially answer your question. I, okay, I have two questions more and we are running out of time. So we may go a couple of minutes over, but Chris, another, or maybe Ben, uh, any of both. So, uh, you know, you can get almost real time uh, images and actually you can use AI, an AI system can tell you if it is correct or not. But imagine that it tells you that it's correct. The image is correct in real time. Um, do you have a connection with thresholds for that they are overcome so that you can uh, talk immediately about risk and action? Get out of here, you have 10 minutes to go. And do you have any example that uh, where this has been used? A any, any of you if, you, if you can answer that. Not necessarily aware, uh, say, LIDAR being used in that type of application, but people have used inclinometers. Most commonly, people are using climatic data like rain gauges and the likes of that to inform evacuation or uh, uh, early warning systems. But it's, it's an interesting dance because false alarms have a big impact, too, if you make the wrong call. I have heard of systems in Switzerland and Italy being used mainly with climatic data, but Chris might expound on this a bit more. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, I think it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, if it's like an individual house kind of setting where an individual's on a landslide and they've got cracks to their home, then the, um, there's some really low, low tech, which is essentially um, a, a kind of an extensometer linked to an alarm across a crack. And, and that can be that can be enough when it when it comes to as ben, said, ben said, rainfall thresholds, we have to be really careful because, you know, the conditions that triggered the say the debris flow may be quite different to the conditions that trigger the next every flow. So what ends up happening is you set the thresholds very low and you have lots of false alarms, as, as Ben mentioned. So it's a real trade off. Um, and, and it depends on what you're trying to monitor. If it's for life risk, then, you know, it's really complex. The monitoring tech is a tiny, tiny part of it. It's the social science that's the big part. And that means, you know, what does somebody do when they're notified? Can the person actually take evasive action? Is there time enough for the person to be notified and take evasive action? You know, it's really, that's the complex stuff. The actual tech itself is actually not that important, to be honest. 
that's fair from a life risk perspective if it's infrastructure then it's different okay uh, i can throw in a quick comment so for, for most of the infrastructure construction project for sure the threshold related to all the rds point but one of the challenges is when engineer define a threshold the threshold related to construction induced deformation but when you put a high accuracy instrument that you capture the combined effects nature response combined with the construction induced um, uh, deformation, right? So our human eye is not able to capture the deformation, but even though without construction, our earth is moving, it's breathing, moving up and down in millimeter accuracy. And then when you put a threshold, that threshold is for everything. So having a baseline is very important. Okay, I think we are right on the hour, but I would like to give Mike the last opportunity here to finish. And first of all, there has been a lot of kudos about your presentation and your image, the swarm image. They want that, to have that image if you can provide that. <laughs> so that, that's very good. But um, what are the Mike, what are the main impediments? If you can finish talking about a little bit about the main impediments of to using these tools more widely. That's a great question. Um, you know, I think there, there's, I saw some of the other questions coming in as well, and, and somebody alluded to the fact of like over trust of the data. You know, I think one of the biggest barriers that slowed the adoption of LIDAR is you've got really cool data that visually people like, oh, this, this looks good, this makes sense, but wasn't quite accurate. People didn't quite know what they were doing or there were issues with the data. There was a class example in the early days of airborne LIDAR where you would have two flight lines that were offset and they weren't adjusted properly together. And it looks very close to a new fault. Um, and so people are like, oh, we discovered this new fault. Well, it turns out it follows the trajectory of the airplane perfectly, right? And so I think that's probably one of the biggest impediments is where people know enough to be dangerous and start kind of working with the data and, and making mistakes and are honestly interrogating the data enough. Um, and, and those kind of propagate through and then people kind of hit that point where they, they don't trust anymore. And I, I think we've cleared that path with, um, with LIDAR. I think, you know, that's, that's moved on. There's more opportunities for people to get trained and get that experience and, and you know, really kind of have that confidence. Um, as, as was mentioned earlier in the webinar, really that kind of concert of technologies puts in that checks and balances, that redundancy, you know, all of those kind of basic surveying principles that, that are, are taught. Um, you know, check your work, <laughs> get measure it twice, you know, all those, all those kind of things, you know, are really kind of the key to ensure that it's, that it's used effectively. You know, sure, there's, there's organizational barriers. It's, it's sometimes hard to make that case to invest up front. Uh, but once you start looking into economics and the value of it, then, then those impediments kind of start to, to fall away. Okay. Okay, with that, I think that um, we should close the webinar. I think it's, it has been very good. I am seeing a lot of thank yous and congratulations. So I would like to pass that to, to, the, to this group. Uh, it was excellent. So thank you everybody for joining and until the next webinar, have a good one. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks thank everyone. You, thank you everybody so for much. Appreciate the great questions and discussion.